In this video, we're going to do an HDR composition of these two images, one with an exposure time of 1 minute and the other with an exposure time of 10 minutes. And we're going to do this using the HDR composition tool. Before we start, let's take a look at the criteria the input images must meet. HDR composition works with master lights. We can generate these using the WBPP script. In this case, we have a dataset taken with a monochrome camera and RGB filters. There are two exposure times for each filter, 300 seconds and 30 seconds. WBPP automatically separates the light frames based on their exposure time, and we can configure this separation in this tab here. This parameter sets the minimum difference in exposure time between two light frames for them to be considered separately rather than grouped together. For each filter, we have a list of light frames with an exposure time of 300 seconds and a list of light frames with an exposure time of 30 seconds. Here you can see we have the same for the green filter and the red filter. Later, we're going to use the frames with each exposure time to generate a color image. So, if the images were taken with a monochrome camera, first we need to combine the three master lights for each exposure time to create one image using channel combination. The color calibration must always be executed before the HDR composition, and because we have to execute SPCC, we also need to activate the solution. Once we've done all this, we'll have a color image for each exposure time. The two images you can see here were taken with a color camera, so we don't need to combine the images from each filter to obtain the color image. However, as you can see, the color isn't calibrated. We must always apply the color calibration to the image with a shorter exposure time because the other images in the HDR composition will adapt to it. As we have the astrometric solution, and we know this because we can see the equatorial coordinates in the readout, we can execute SPCC on the image. We select an area of the sky background as the region of interest, and in this case we don't need to change any of the other default parameters. Now the color of the image is correct. Let's save it to disk. Remember, we don't need to calibrate the image with a higher exposure. Now we're ready to execute HDR composition. We select the 60-second image with the color calibration applied and the 600-second image and execute the process. The result is two images. One is the mask defining the areas onto which the short exposure image is superimposed, and the other is the HDR composition. Although we can see the nucleus and the trapezium here, this composition contains all the details of the long exposure image. If we apply the mask to the original long exposure image, invert it, and disable the STF, we can see that the mask covers an area a little larger than the saturated areas. We can control this using the binarizing threshold parameter, which by default is set to 0.8 or 80% of the image's saturation point. This saturation point is relative because not all cameras saturate at 1. For example, in this image, the saturation point is around 0.42 in the red. So we're setting the binarizing threshold to 0.42 multiplied by 0.8, which is 0.34. If we decrease it to 0.5, we select a larger area around the nucleus of the nebula because we're going down to lower brightness levels. This binarizing threshold is very important because we don't ever want to get close to the camera's saturation point. What makes this tool unique is that it makes an HDR composition out of linear images, but all cameras lose a little linearity when they approach their saturation point. We therefore recommend that you don't set a threshold too close to 1. There are two other parameters for the mask, smoothness and growth. Let's look at mask smoothness first. The smoothness setting is required because a combination of two images is never going to be perfect. 
This isn't the tool's fault, but is down to the integrity of the data. Let's see what happens if we take away the smoothness. Now the mask is pretty sharp and this may pose a problem. It's always important to look at what's happening around the edges of the mask, in other words, in the areas where one image mixes with the other. HDR images are difficult to display because we can't display the dark areas and the bright ones at the same time, so we recommend pushing the image to its limit to see if the two images have integrated well. So, let's disable the mask and process the image very aggressively using a histogram adjustment, disabling the STF, applying an aggressive dynamic range compression, and curves to increase the contrast. Now, if we display the mask, we can see that there are no artifacts in the area where the mask separates one image from the other. In this example, the combination is almost perfect, but this is quite rare. Let's experiment with another data set. We're going to integrate these two images. They both have an exposure time of 30 minutes, but one was taken with an F8 refractor and the other with an F3.3 Newtonian. As the Newtonian has faster optics, the saturated area around the nucleus of the nebula is much larger. Let's integrate them again without any smoothness. and we're going to apply an aggressive processing sequence similar to the one we did before. It's not a pretty image and the result isn't correct, but we can use it to see if the images have been integrated correctly by looking at the edges of the mask. As you can see, here there are some problems with mixing the two images. We can see the exact outline of the mask. Because the images were taken with different telescopes and cameras, the combination of the two images will never be perfect. In this case, we need quite a high smoothness value. Let's compare this result with the previous one using a preview and pixel math. First, we apply the same aggressive processing sequence. We disable the mask and use pixel math to superimpose image HDR1. With the new mask smoothness setting, the artificial edges disappear, or at the very least, they are hidden. This means we can combine images that can't really be combined perfectly. The second mask parameter in the HDR Composition tool is Mask Growth. Let's look at how it works using these two images of M51. Although this is quite an unusual case these days because almost all the images we use are CMOS, in these two images we're going to use a short exposure time to correct the blooming in this CCD image of the galaxy. In other words, we're going to replace the areas saturated by blooms with data from the nuclei. If we execute with default parameters, the blooms don't completely disappear.
This is because the smoothness of the blooming in the mask causes the bright border to be superimposed slightly onto the short exposure image. To correct this, we need to increase the area covered by the mask. Now the blooms have grown, and if we look at the image, no trace of them is visible, not in the nucleus of the first galaxy, nor in the nucleus of the second, nor in the bright star. There are two factors we must take into account when working with this tool. The first is that HDR Composition evaluates the brightness of all the images we are going to integrate and puts them in order from the one with the highest saturation to the one with the lowest. However, this can fail in some specific cases. If it doesn't work, we can deactivate automatic exposure evaluation and put the images in order manually. The images with the highest exposure should be at the top and the ones with the lowest exposure at the bottom. So, in this case, this image will go at the top, this one will be second, third, fourth, and fifth. If we do this and click on Apply, it will work correctly. We get the composite image and the four masks. If we change the order of these two images, we'll get an error message because the tool won't be able to make the mask with the first two images. Another thing to remember when working with HDR composition is that some images have a very high dynamic range. For example, this composition of five images needs at least 30 bits to display everything accurately without any data loss. If we stretch this image with STF, it looks posterized. It's not really posterized, but STF works with 16 bits by default. If we enable 24-bit mode, the posterization disappears. This isn't a flaw in the tool, and it doesn't mean that we're losing data when we combine the images. The posterization also completely disappears when we do the stretch using histogram transformation. Once we've got the composite image, we can proceed with the nonlinear processing. Mm -hmm.